Hello everybody, welcome back to episode 49 of the video series in which we program an entire video game from scratch in the beautiful C programming language. So last time, last episode, we vectorized, we vectorized our blit background to buffer function, right? And in so doing, we increased our uh, basically the, the overall performance of our game since um, blip background is having to fill the entire buffer our entire back buffer on each frame um, it's you know has has to do so much work it so it's very important for it to be um, to perform as well as possible um, the next step uh, would be I, I really need to vectorize uh, blit 32 BPB bitmap to buffer as well uh, because um, this is the other function that I use to draw everything else besides the background um, you know the sprites go through this function and anytime I draw a string of text it also ends up going through this function as well um, so you can see in fact if you take a look at the performance of the game and you you may have already caught on to this uh, if you've been paying attention but if you if you notice right now we're just sitting here still in the game and when I hit F1 the debug stats the debug text is gonna pop up in the upper left hand corner and when that happens you're going to notice if you t if you look at the FPS really quickly you'll notice that it is really high until the text shows up and then it dips dramatically. There, it started at 3300, now it's 15, now it's at 1200, 1100. So it, it's the act of drawing the text itself is dragging our, our game down significantly. So because of that, I would really like to um, vectorize this function. Um, I think that'll make it a lot faster. Um, but you know what? I don't think we're going to do that today. Uh, I don't think I'm ready to do that today. Um, last time was a pretty intense episode, um, and I kind of want to change gears a little bit here. Um, but you know what? Before we do anything, first, before we do anything, uh, we have some comments to address. So, Let me go over here to the comments. All right, first commenter says, I've just started watching your series. I think that the difference in FPS between the first iteration of non-SIMD clear screen and the current one is due to memcopy being faster than memcopy S. Maybe I'm wrong or you already thought about it in future episodes. Anyway, thank you. Okay, um, good question. First of all, uh, this is, you know, this guy, uh, whoever this person is, um, you know, they've since they just started watching, they made this comment on episode 13, um, so it's, it's pretty long ago. Um, we don't even need the, we don't use the clear screen function anymore. Um, and in fact, I've, I've deleted it. I don't even, I don't even have the clear screen function anymore. I, I just completely removed it. Um, but as for the performance difference between memcopy and memcopy s, you know, it, that is still, like, Memcopy S is still relevant. Um, it is still something that is relevant to talk about. Uh, if I go to Blitzstring, yeah, see, like, when I'm doing um, all of this, this work with copying memory uh, off of the font sheet and then creating a new uh, string bitmap and all this kind of stuff, um, that's basically where the bulk of our uh, of our CPU cycles are going right now, are all these all these mem copies, um, and hopefully this is one of the things uh, that I'm going to make better whenever I decide to uh, vectorize this stuff, uh, because it is the main drag on our performance right now. Not that our performance is terrible. I mean, 3300 FPS in in debug mode. Um, is fine. Uh, it's it's not like I'm really worried about performance. This is not the kind of game where I need to be worried that much about performance. But um, I still would at, at least like to, you know, 
vectorize just just a little bit more and then we'll be done with SIMD. That's the last bit of, of SIMD we'll, we'll do in the whole game. Um, but anyway, so the difference between memcopy and memcopy s. Is there a difference in performance between memcopy and memcopy s? Um, I don't know for sure. I would have to run tests to find out. I will say that my my instinct tells me that the that there may be a very very slight performance difference because memcopy s takes in additional parameters and it does something extra that memcopy does not do. Uh, it it checks to uh, make sure that the the buffer that you're trying to copy into is big enough to hold the thing that you're about to copy into it. The the whole point of memcopy s is it's supposedly supposed to be more secure because it's supposed to check uh, the size of the buffer you're copying into so that you don't write past the end of the buffer and end up you know overwriting some other memory in the program and that's something that can be taken that can cause bugs in your program it can, and also cause um, uh, uh, you know like security situations where um, a malicious person uh, a, a malicious actor could you know exploit that flaw in your program and you know overwrite some memory that you know they're they were not supposed to be able to do uh, not supposed most not supposed to be able to um, write into and they could potentially um, you know basically write some code into memory or some CPU instructions and then your program might unwittingly execute that code and you know then the then the hackers off to the races but anyway okay so 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 basically I do think that memcopy s may be like one or two CPU cycles slower than regular memcopy but do I think it's enough to make a difference no I don't I don't think that it's big enough to make much of a difference um, and that's me just guessing like I said I'd have to test to know for sure but I don't think it's I don't think it's a big deal anyway we're not going to use we're not using clear screen anymore anyway because uh, we've got like a um, intrinsic uh, store uh, stos D uh, and there's actually store all sorts of stuff which we talked about in one of these episodes um, I don't remember which episode we talked about it but um, we can essentially use a, a CPU intrinsic to to write uh, basically pattern fill the entire buffer which is the exact same which achieves the exact same effect as the clear screen function therefore the clear screen function is now redundant and we don't need it anymore um, all right next question commenter says just now found the series it looks great and I want to follow along from the beginning could you add git tags so it is possible to download the code after a specific episode or is there another way to download a specific version that I'm not aware of that is a great question um, I've never even considered it I don't even actually know what git tags are so I'll have to uh, look that up um, but that is a great idea now I know that you can if you click on this little history button um, you know each one of these each one of these commits you know is still stored here you can actually I know you can check out individual commits if you want to go back in time uh, to an earlier episode so um, yeah you could just get check out and then you need the the, the commit uh, that it is and it'll it'll take you back in time um, All right. That being said, all right. Let's see. Um, let me look for more comments. Okay. This commenter says, "I'm new to the series. Is there any reason you chose to use one big 38 megabyte bitmap for the world instead of a tile map? Also, on the SIMD, are your programs limited to using a fixed amount of memory in the registers?" Okay. So let me take the first part of that question: the 38 megabyte bitmap. Um, right here right here yeah he's talking about this overworld bitmap uh, overworld uh, map right here and it is it's huge it's like 38 megabytes or maybe more now that we've expanded it it is it is absolutely gigantic and I fully realize um, 
and I, I know I, I explained this uh, when we first started using this uh, bitmap as well, I fully realized that it's ridiculous and if it, it, it's if I were programming on an old really old machine like an NES or an SNES there's absolutely no way that I would be able to do something like this because they just those machines those old machines just did not have that much memory um, so I would not be able to get away with using this giant bitmap at all however on modern machines even the the smallest uh, devices that we use these days like you know Raspberry Pis and uh, cell phones, even on those platforms, 38 megabytes of memory is just, it's kind of like nothing. So it's not a big deal. Um, 38 megabytes in memory, um, it just doesn't bother me. Um, and furthermore, since we store this in a compressed format in the assets file, it compresses to almost nothing. So you don't, you know, see it, you don't really notice it taking up any space on your, on your hard drive. So that's why it, it was basically just a path of least resistance, path of least resistance sort of situation, uh, where you know, I, like I had, I drew, I, I wrote the thing to blit a bitmap to a screen, and I was like, well, I, I can draw bitmaps on the screen now, so I guess I can just, you know, I'll just draw a giant bitmap on the background, on the back of the, you know, across the entire screen, and that'll be that'll be our background, that'll be our world. Um, that being said, I may switch to a tile map sometime in the future if I need to, but um, I don't really know. I don't. I don't think I'll switch. This seems to be seems to be working fine. The second part of your question, I don't understand what he means. He says, also on the SIMD, are your programs limited to using a fixed amount of memory in the registers? Okay, I don't know. I, I asked. I asked this commenter for clarification on that and the clarification is sorry my SIMD question wasn't clear what is the maximum amount of data you can load into the registers for a single instruction oh well that's simple so um, in the in, in SSE and SSE2 and SSE3 I think all of those and, and you can go and look at the history of, of SIMD as well I mean as Gener new generations of chips have come out. You know, SIMD continues getting better uh, as we go along. Uh, you know, like AVX is a newer version. Uh, it's newer than SSE. Therefore, it has uh, a few more um, intrinsics, a few more instructions, and it also uh, comes with bigger registers. So, um, on my processor, I've got uh, I've got the the SSE and SSE2 and SSE3, um, all of those families of technologies use 128-bit registers. So, and I can I can just set a breakpoint here and start this. And um, look at I mean you can look at them right here. These are my CPU registers. Um, I think these 64-bit ones, these MM0, I think this is like the first generation of, of SIMD, and I guess it was, um, yeah, I guess it was just like SSE version 1, and then at some point, let me see, where is, oh, MMX, that's what it was called, sorry, for some reason I forgot all about MMX. That's the oldest version of SIMD. Uh, and then later SSE came along. You notice I just enabled the SSE registers um, the out to, to be in the output here. These are 128 bits. And you know think about this in terms of you know we're, we're only using SIMD for um, manipulating pixel data because that's what we do the most of in this game right is draw graphics. So we can think about this in terms of pixels you know this is 128 bits so I can jam I can jam four pixels in there right because uh, each pixel is uh, 32 bits so I can jam four pixels in here and then operate uh, on all four pixels and do an operation on all four pixels with like a single instruction so a uh, great uh, improvement in speed and then these YMM registers are for AVX AVX is just a newer 
iteration of SIMD, and it comes with these registers that are 512, I'm sorry, two, I'm sorry, 256 bits. Um, so you can you can you can jam eight pixels into here at a time and operate on eight pixels at once. Um, now there is, I you notice that uh, this AVX 512 version is grayed out. It's because my processor is not capable of AVX 512, um, and not very many people have processors that are capable of AVX 512 yet. Um, in a, you know, give it a few years and it'll be more widely adopted. And, but for now, we don't need to worry about it because not that many people are using AVX 512. Um, furthermore, there is something I wanted to say since we're talking about SIMD. During the debugging of this, you will notice I, I basically have been I basically have been um, with with the use of pound pound define AVX right here. You know I can do pound define AVX or I can change this to SSE two and it it you know changes some of the code that we've written to only use the older intrinsics. Um, it's for you know I guess if someone has a really old a really old uh, processor and I want to compile this for people for those for those people that have you know that don't have AVX. Uh, on their processors. So um, what I wanted to mention though is that if I do this on my machine and I switch this to SSE2 and then I go to my code and I start debugging um, I, I start debugging some vectorized code like let's go to blit background to buffer there all this stuff and then I start debugging this. What you'll notice is that Visual, at least on in, in Visual Studio, I don't know if other compilers are the same way, but even in debug mode you will still see these uh, intrinsics taking advantage of the YMM registers. Even though these instructions are supposed to be specific to uh, SSE or MMX or whatever it's called, the older version, and they're only supposed to be 128 bits. You'll still notice that even in debug mode, uh, you know, even without the compiler doing extra optimizations for you, it's still the compiler will still sometimes use the YMM registers whenever it wants to, just because I think it, you know it sees that I have the YMM registers on my processor and is like if it's if the you know, if the processor can support it, I'm going to use it. So that's all I'm trying to say is like sometimes if you you think you're you're using SSE and, and you know you're using these 128 bit uh, data types, um, but the compiler is still going to sometimes use the YMM registers if it if it wants to if it feels like it can you know I don't know why it does that and I don't know if all compilers are like that but. That's how it is. Um, all right, next question. Okay, I think that's all the questions from YouTube. I did also get one interesting comment from um, Reddit, where the commenter says, "The commenter says I suggest you use milliseconds per frame as the unit of measurement instead of FPS, as those can be misleading." And um, it was a I mean, it's like a highly upvoted comment, so apparently everyone agrees with it. Um, and then he, he posted a, a, a link to an article, this article. And it's a good article. Um, you can go and read it. But the reason why, like, I'm still on the fence about it in, and that I still think that FPS is fine for us is because um, I think that the premise of this article is sort of based on a straw man fallacy where it assumes that every frame, the time taken to render each frame is going to vary wildly, like wildly. And we, starting with that assumption, he then goes on to make the argument that that's why 
you can't use FPS, you can't use an average of FPS over time because you're going to measure the you're going to measure the frames that that were rendered very quickly when all the other frames that you don't measure are going to go slow. And it's like you're not I mean it's not wrong, it's just blown out of it's just like it's it's that's an exaggeration. Um, you know, it's not like it's not like I'm uh, every time I measure I'm going to be measuring, you know, way up here and then every time you know, every other frame, every other frame is going to go much slower than the ones that I measure. Um, I mean, it's just not really. And also, you know, what I still don't really, what I don't really get is, I mean, we are measuring, we are measuring milliseconds per frame. F FPS, it, it is milliseconds per frame, just, it's just expressed differently. Right, it's just a different. I don't know. So I don't know. I guess I'm I'm, I'm really on the fence about this article. Um, and secondly, I don't know that I care this much about you know because like we are already achieving uh, performance that that is well beyond. Um, like we're never. I don't think we're ever going to need to worry about performance. You. At the end of the day, we're going to be able to run this on, you know, probably a very slow machine, and it's going to work fine. So, um, I don't know. Now, if if I ever get into a situation in the future where you know I need to run this game like on a wristwatch or something, and I need to start optimizing at that low of a level, then you know, then I'll I'll come back and revisit this and you know eat humble pie and say okay you were right all along I should have been doing it this way um, but as for right now I think what we're doing is perfectly fine okay so I think that does it for all of the questions and like I said I, I think what I'm gonna do now I think I'm gonna do a little bit of world building because um, you know, I feel like taking it easy today, and I'm not quite ready to vectorize this other blitting function just yet, so I think instead I'm going to do some world building. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'll show you. I'm going to open this overworld01.tmx. And, okay, first thing I'm going to do is this, uh, this tile right here drives me absolutely nuts because it doesn't um, it doesn't line up when you tile it so it's just like maddening so I'm gonna change it okay so I've launched a sprite and I've loaded up this uh, brick tile um, something that annoys me is that every time I launch a sprite um, well a I have to launch Steam, uh, and Steam has to be running um, for me to to launch uh, this this app here, which really annoys me. So I'll probably have to switch over to using the uh, portable version as opposed to the Steam integrated version. And the other thing that annoys me is that I have to reload this NES palette every single time that I launch. Every time I launch the app, uh, the palette has been reset to the def default and I have to load the NES palette over again so that's annoying uh, but but okay so we need to change this tile and first I want to look at something and I want you guys to see something you know the kind of aesthetic that I'm going for um, is a very I'm going for you know Dragon Warrior NES type aesthetic and and y'all know this but there there are a couple different like there are lots of different Dragon Warrior games um, and I want you to see the difference here between alright if you if you take a look if you take this as an example uh, 
if you take this as an, as an example, you'll notice that all these tiles are just, how would you, how would you describe this? Where it's sort of like a bird's eye view, uh, it's like top down, I don't know if you would call it isometric or, or what, but it's just like, you know, the camera is just like straight, is like looking straight down. It's at a, you know, perpendicular angle. On the other hand, if you look at Dragon Warrior 2 and you go and look at, here you go, go and look at this example. I didn't really want, I actually didn't want a YouTube video on this one. I just want this to be bigger. That's as big as it's going to get. Um, but what I wanted to show you is look how look at the difference here where they've sort of made an effort to make this three dimensional. Uh, you've got these 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 tiles over here that are like uh, it's these tiles over here are like a more um, I don't know how else to call it. They've just they've just got more of a three dimensional look to them. And uh, I think that looks a bit more, uh, that definitely looks more, more polished. Um, so I say we, we, we'd go for that. Um, all right, so first things first, we need to fix this, we need to fix this mess. And I need, let's just select all this and delete it. bucket all right and now instead of a black which I think is probably a little too harsh oh by the way this uh, NES palette um, as you can see there's not very many colors here um, that's why the NES graphics were pretty ugly for the most part um, but the the actual NES was even more restrictive um, there were limitations uh, you couldn't actually show all of these colors on the screen at once you could actually only show a subset of these colors uh, on the screen at a time um, because that's just how limited the NES hardware was um, we're not obviously we're not going to adhere to those restrictions but I just thought it was interesting all right so how do we make this tile first of all I'm gonna make it more like it's like a floor instead of a wall and I'm going to All right, I'm gonna save that. Uh, if I reopen it, see how it looks. That looks um, still not good. Better, but still not good. Let's make another tile. I'm going to call it uh, 16 by 16. RGBA oh, that's cute I have to load the NES palette again 
for each individual owner. Is there a way to set that as the default or something? I don't know. So, see, I'm kind of hoping that gives a sort of a three-dimensional look of like a wall. I'm going to name it um, Bricks02. Bricks02. Okay. I'm going to go back to Tiled. I'm going to add this to the tile set. Bricks of two. There we go. three these work for that too. There. That gives a, a bit of more um, depth to our little, little room, doesn't it? to export as image, export to PNG, export, yes. 
course. Close that. Save. Close that. Need to load this. Save as a 32-bit BMPX. Yes. And then we need to rebuild our assets file by running by running our batch file, which is right here. Okay. Let's launch the game. Breakpoint. All right, still looks bad, but better than better than it did yesterday. What I want to do now is I want to add um, a fade transition when you hit the portal. Because uh, I don't want the teleportation to seem instant. I want there to be sort of a feeling of a passage of time there as you go through a door or a portal or a staircase or whatever it is. So I'm going to figure out how to do that. Um, what happens if I go... Oh, I think I also want to change the music that plays when we're inside that little room. So, hmm. Interesting. I'm going to go to initialize globals. Whoops. Initialize globals. Okay, portal. I think I want to add, um, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself here, but I kind of want to add, uh, change this uh, where this this dungeon 01 area. I kind of want to change it from being just a rectangle. Right now, it's just a rectangle of coordinates. I want to make it a whole thing that has not only the rectangle of coordinates, but also um, like what music should play while I'm here. I also want to give it a name, um, and then when you when you enter, it could just like flash the name of the place that you just went into um, at the bottom of the screen or something sort of like fade that in and out uh, I think that would be cool um, alright so let's go ahead and do that I think it's an overworld.h right So let's make a new structure. We're going to call it type def uh, struct um, game area. name 
music. And then um, we change our portal. Our portal will now contain an, a game area instead of a rectangle game area, which I need to define this first. Oh, yeah, game area. Um, on second thought, I'm going to hold off on that. I think I may do that later, uh, but that's probably too big of a project uh, to tackle uh, today in just the amount of time that we have left. Overworld.c So I'm going to uh, try an experiment here. Uh, I'm trying to create that fade effect. I want to redo that, that fade in effect when I hit the portal. So I'm going to try to, what if I reset uh, my all of my local state in this function, like local frame counter and brightness adjustment. Let's just see what happens when I run over this portal. Oh, that didn't work at all. Let's see. So let's see what happens. 
Oh, sorry. I shouldn't do that. I should put it uh, here. So I think that works. Um, except for the music, right? I need a way of detecting, of knowing whether music is already playing or not. All right, so there is an X Audio 2 voice state. In fact, let's not do it here. We're going to need this function. Let's go ahead and make this function um, main.h. We'll make it there. We go. We'll make it a boolean. Uh, music is playing. This is not what I named it. I'm looking for my mu the name of my music source voice. Oh, I just named it GX Audio, not GX Audio 2. Okay. There is a get state function. Source voice. State. No flags. If state dot buffers queued is greater than zero, then yes, there is music playing, and I shall return true. return false. There we go. Now I'll go back to overworld.c. If music is playing equals false,
much better. Okay. So I think that's probably all the time that we have for today. Um, so what did we get accomplished? Um, basically, all we really did was we made our um, our little test room a little bit pretty uh, prettier than it was. Still doesn't look that good, but it looks better than it did. Um, and then we made it. We enhanced our portal handler so that it would. Um, create a fade effect. Uh, it would create a fade effect when you would step through it and I think it looks a lot better that way as opposed to just instantly transporting you to the new place. Um, it sort of fades in. Um, so obviously I really wanted to what I want to do next is I want to enhance our um, area so that it has like a name so that what, what, I, what I want to happen is whenever you transport into the little, the little dungeon room I want some text to appear at the bottom to have like the name of the place that you just entered whether it be the name of a it'll, the name of a town or you know what have you um, Yeah, I think that would be cool. But anyway, I think we're out of time for today, so I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap it up. As always, thank you for watching, and if you have any questions or comments about anything that you have seen on this episode or any other episode, uh, please don't hesitate to leave your questions or comments on the video. I will address any interesting comments in an upcoming episode. Um, also, don't forget that we have a companion uh, GitHub repository that you can uh, clone and you can follow along at home. And if you enjoy uh, this video series, if you want to continue seeing you know, the development of this game, uh, then please hit the like button, uh, please subscribe to the channel, tell your friends, all that good stuff. And that is it for today, guys, so until next time. I'll see you in a few days. Bye.